Hello, everyone. My, my name is, is Ephraim Katsir. And on behalf of Sephardic Heritage International in DC or Shin DC, I'd like to welcome all of you. Today, we have a special program, Sephardic and Romaniot for Shavuot, with an emphasis on the Romaniot part, with chef and food writer, Susan Barocas. So I'll now turn, turn the, the floor over to our moderator, Rachel Villali Glazer. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. Uh, it's been a while since we've been together. So uh, we're very excited about today's program and so happy that Susan Barocas could be with us. Uh, so before we get onto that part, just, uh, uh, just a little bit of an introduction um, to Shavuot, um, just to bring us all on, on the same page. Um, of course, we are in the middle of the, well, towards the end of the counting of the Omer. Today is the 35th day, and in 14 days will be Shavuot. Uh, and we have been counting from Pesach, from the uh, Festival of Freedom, up towards uh, Har Sinai, Mount Sinai, to the receiving of the Ten Commandments. Um, and we just passed Lagba Omer on Friday, the 33rd day. Um, I can't, we can't not think about the terrible tragedy in Israel uh, where people were going to uh, Mount Meron and uh, had that uh, terrible, uh, just, just a tragedy needlessly uh, to happen. So uh, we're thinking about those families and, and uh, hoping that uh, such a thing never occurs again. Um, so, uh, so with Shavuot, we uh, come to Revelation and what that means to the Jewish people, the receiving of the Ten Commandments, the receiving of the Torah, depending on your point of view, uh, written and oral, depending on your point of view, and uh, some of the customs that go along with that. So for many people, Shavuot is kind of the forgotten holiday, even though it's on the same level as the three pilgrimage festivals, Sukkot, Pesach, and Shavuot, uh, it uh, somehow fell mostly to the Jewish schools to continue its observance uh, because it's also, of course, known as a scholar's holiday because of the study of the Torah and Tikkun Leil Shavuot. And Jewish schools have graduations and confirmations and, and those kinds of uh, ceremonies in many individual people sort of began to forget about Shavuot. For us of the Greek heritage, um, some of us may remember customs from Shavuot, maybe not. Uh, most of the customs that remain have to do with two things mostly, decorating, decorating the synagogues and, uh, and foods, of course. Um, in terms of decoration, some of us might remember flowers, especially roses in synagogues uh, because roses were, were connected to Mount Sinai when the Torah, what, with Revelation, the mountain was in full bloom. And uh, some of us, uh, you know, might never have had that experience. Um, here in America, we sure are aware of all the dairy foods, mostly Ashkenazi that, uh, you know, blintzes and cheesecakes and those kinds of things. But uh, Greek Jews also had a, quite a rich history of uh, foods, symbolic foods. Susan will talk more about that. Um, lots of symbolism uh, in, in everything, decorations and foods. So um, we will have time for questions, but what we would like you to do is write your questions as you think of them in the chat. So while there's a break in between uh, Susan's cooking and hard work, um, we'll be able to talk about that. So um, that said, um, Susan Barocas is a writer, chef, teacher, and speaker with a passion for healthy eating, Jewish food, and Sephardic cuisine and history. Um, founding director of the Innovative Jewish Food Experience, Susan served as the guest chef for President Obama's White House Seders for, uh, from 2014 to 2016. Wow. Uh, her writing appears in the Washington Post, HuffPost, Moment Magazine, and the Nasher, among other outlets. 
And in 2019, she was recognized with a Rakauer Award from the American Jewish Press Association for her story in Lilith magazine. When Food Betrayed the Jews was the name of the article. She has made many broadcast appearances and organized food conferences for American University and Chazon, among others. Susan is a member of the Les Dames d'Escoffier and is at work on her first cookbook, which we'll be excited to see as well. So Suzanne, thank you for being our guest today. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Ephraim. I'm really pleased to be here. I know many of you who are on this call today, uh, and there are people who have joined who are not normally part of the Greek family uh, Zoom. And so I'm really delighted uh, to have everyone here. And I just wanna say for those of you who don't know me very well, or don't know me at all yet in person. So my background is, um, is Sephardic, but uh, my grandfather was from a, a city outside of Istanbul, a town, but my grandmother was from Monastir. And so I grew up with a lot of um, kind of Greek influences, like my dolmas are yaprakas, the Greek word, uh, as opposed to the Turkish, and they're, they're very lemony. So it's really interesting that I've got all of this in my background and, and um, I appreciate all of it very much. So I just wanted to quickly talk about the food of Shavuot. It is, there's so much symbolism in the food we eat for Jewish holidays and Shavuot is absolutely no different. So basically what you're looking at is both the giving of the 10 commandments, the law that we live by, but also it's thanks for the spring harvest, just as Sukkot is a Thanksgiving holiday for the harvest at the end of summer. So this is the spring harvest. And one of the reasons we eat things with wheat is because it's the first wheat harvest. And we eat fruit um, on this holiday because of the first fruits. And we eat, of course, dairy because, uh, you know, this is the, the season when goats and sheep have their young and there's an abundance of milk it's flowing freely, literally. And um, so there's a lot of dairy. Also, it's symbolic of Israel um, being the, the land of milk and honey. And, and when we get to the dates, that dish very much symbolizes kind of the marriage of milk and honey. Um, there are so many dishes uh, that are typical among Sephardim and Romanio. Uh, you have things like borecas, frittatas, uh, quajado, spongato, whatever you call it. They're similar baked casserole dishes with cheese and eggs and lots of veggies. Um, Spanakopita, uh, pita, the egg lemon sauces, including for fish, is very common at this time of year, eating lamb. Um, you know, there's a wonderful cheesecake, the kusmeri, I think is the right pronunciation, I hope, and that's the Greek cheesecake. So uh, it's not just the Ashkenazi who get to eat cheesecake. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, you know, there's this thing of los siete cielos, the seven heavens, uh, which is common. Uh, among, uh, among uh, Sephardim and some Romaniot. And this is a special bread. There's so many different recipes uh, for this, but it, it's a bread that basically you have a large ball of dough, that's Mount Sinai, and around it, either halfway or three quarters or all the way, you have coils of dough that represent the, the seven kind of they, layers represent the clouds that were around Mount Sinai. So nobody see what was going on when Moses was up on top of the mountain. And also very importantly, this bread has many symbols that are made in dough and put onto it. Jacob's ladder, the, the tablets themselves, Torah scrolls, um, uh, sometimes if there's extra dough, some little birds. So there's a lot, um, just, and this is just touching very lightly on a lot of symbolism around food in this holiday. Um, for those who are new to this group and don't know about Romani oat Jews, uh, I just want to quickly say that this is a group that's often overlooked or forgotten in terms of um, the range and the variety of Jews of different heritage. Uh, they tend to get overtaken by the Sephardim because in the Ottoman Empire, which is the land of what is now Greece and what is now Turkey, the Romanio were there when this huge Sephardim influx came from uh, Iberia. Now, the difference is the Sephardim I mean, the Romaniote 
have been like in Greece, for example, as many of you know, for over 2,300 years. They're the longest continuous Jewish community in Europe, uh, which is quite a record. They don't speak Ladino as other Sephardim do. It's really a Greek Jewish tradition. They speak Greek. Um, so it's, you know, something that we want to hang on to. And there are some different recipes um, than there is for the Romani oat than there are for um, Sephardim in general. Uh, I also just want to point out that if anyone is not familiar with the Kihila um, Kedosha Yanina, the synagogue on the Lower East Side in New York, this is the only synagogue uh, with Romani oat traditions and rituals in the Western Hemisphere. Um, the synagogue, the community came together in 1906, a bunch of immigrants in Lower East Side, New York. They built this building in around 1925, 27. Um, and if you want to know more, because this is really a wonderful tradition to know about, wonderful um, kind of Jewish heritage to know about, the um, Yanina Synagogue's website, uh, which is KKJSM, Kehila Kedasha Yanina SM, uh, is built in .org. So go to that website. You can read lots and lots of history if you don't know and uh, activities that are going on still. So now let's talk food more specifically. Um, so first let's talk about halibut because halibut covers this huge variety of confections, desserts, sweets, whatever you want to call them. Um, and halibut is such a great example of how food travels and the intermixing of foods and recipes across borders um, for all different kinds of reasons. And halva is made and called by similar names, halwa and some other names, but halva in the Middle East, Central and Southern Asia, Eastern Europe, the Balkans, the Caucasus, North Africa, and the Horn of Africa. Those are like the places where it's very um, popular, very dominant, very much a part of the cuisine. Made in other places, but that's where it's a big thing. Interestingly, halva originated in Persia as so much of our cuisine really has. Um, the first written reference for halibut is in the seventh century. It's a mixture of mashed dates with milk. Uh, and today there's a wonderful Persian halibut, which is a carrot, walnut, pistachio um, kind of pudding in a sense. And something um, that's really interesting is that halibut can be made from all kinds of ingredients with the basis being either flour like semolina, wheat, uh, sesame, or other bases like vegetables. If you go to jewishfoodexperience.com, you'll see a wonderful carrot halibut recipe from India. Most of the Indian uh, halibuts tend to be made with vegetables, beet, yams, gourds, all kinds of things, not always with any um, uh, grain in them. Nuts are often a part of it or sesame seeds. Um, you know, I grew up having, to me, halva growing up was only, all I knew was the sesame kind with, you know, that you got at the market. In our case, there was a Greek market, which was wonderful growing up in Denver. It's where we could get the kalamatas and the feta and everything that my father craved um, that you couldn't find yet in the 50s and 60s in grocery stores in, in Denver but there was one Greek market. And for those of you who are on, I know there's at least a couple from Denver. It was down on Broadway and it was a wonderful place. The kind of place you'd find on the Lower East Side where you walk in and there's tons of barrels and open sack, smelled of fish, it smelled of olives, it smelled of cheese, it was great. Um, anyway, so going back specifically to Halava, it's interesting that in, you know, there's this, 13th century Andalusian cookbook from, this is when, you know, Moorish Spain. And there are six recipes in this cookbook that are attributed to the Jews. Um, one's an eggplant. Um, and there's some fried, you know, there's a few fried dishes. Uh, and it's interesting because this is the first place where the recipes from the Jews of Spain were written down. The Jews didn't have any cookbook in Spain. Um, they did never wrote a cookbook. Everything was carried in the oral tradition and, and just from kitchen in Iberia to kitchen all over the Ottoman Empire and in, 
and other parts of the world. Um, and so there is a recipe for halava that is um, in that book. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. This is a very old dish, obviously, in whatever form it takes. The Ottoman Empire, um, the Ottomans really adapted and expanded on halva. And one of the things, uh, you know, it spread throughout the empire, which included Greece, what is now Greece, of course. And it's so interesting to think, did this travel with the Jews, the Sephardim who left Spain, because there was such a wonderful marriage between Ottoman cuisine and Sephardic cuisine, did, was halva one of the dishes that traveled? Um, and came to the Ottoman Empire from the Jews. And I need to do more research because I haven't yet uncovered that, um, but I wanna check it out because there's a lot of different dishes that came with the Jews that the Ottoman adapted and adopted. And the same goes for Ottoman dishes into Jewish cuisine. Um, so uh, this idea that it's usually either semolina of some sort wheat, it's usually a coarse wheat, by the way, the fine semolina is used for um, pasta. So you don't wanna use that because it would be very gummy in this kind of a dish. Uh, you can add dried fruit, um, you can like raisins, figs, dates, apricots. You can add a variety of nuts, almonds, pecans, walnuts, pistachios. We use almonds in today's dish that we're making. Um, in some places like in the former Soviet Union, uh, those countries, Bulgaria, Romania, off of the Balkans, there's an interesting halva made from ground sunflower seed. And um, we mentioned the in India, it's also Pakistan that do the very veggie halavas. And there's, if any of you have ever had a chance to have what's called lost halva, it's from Turkey, and it's like strands, it's pulled apart into strands. It's like eating cotton candy only a thousand times better. You know, it's just amazing. It melts in your mouth. And I have found it in the Persian market here in DC, in Yekta, for instance, for people who are on and know that market. So this is something really interesting. Now I got the recipe for today out of this cookbook, which many of you may know. What a fabulous treasure jewel, et cetera. And I thank you, Paulette Nakama, for loaning this to me. Really, it's safe. You'll have it back soon. Um, it's a treasure. So it's very interesting. There's two halava recipes. And one of them, okay, halava one, is um, actually from Salonika. And that's really more of the Sephardic influence. And that's like most halavas that you find in the Sephardic world and in many parts of the world that are um, not baked. They're made uh, in a pot, they're cooked. Even if the nuts are toasted, they're still added to a, almost like a pudding. Or you can think of it as um, uh, like um, a polenta in terms of kind of consistency and mouthfeel of what some of these are like, the pudding one. And that's what this is, the first one. The second one, Halava 2, is from Volos, which by the way is where Paulette was born. And I talk about that in the, if you have a chance to um, look at the article from the Washington Post, it's about uh, Rosh Hashanah and Paulette and her background and has also some other Romanio recipes there. But um, this one that we're making today, and I'm gonna start here in just a moment, is so interesting because it's made, it's baked and it has eggs. The other ones mostly don't have eggs. And so this is a very unique halva. Um, and, you know, I just, it's very interesting to think about how recipes become different. How is that distinctive? And when were the eggs added? When did it start being baked? And by the way, this is what it looks like finished, okay? You can see the syrup has dripped down and made it darken this. And um, actually, this so much reminds me of Tish Pishti. For those of you who know Tish Pishti, this completely reminds me of it. Um, and you know, if you make this dish, you'll see what I mean. You can cut it. And in fact, when it came out of the oven, there are no instructions in this recipe in the book about how you serve it. It just says cut into squares. So um, it says also, by the way, to cool and cut into squares. 
I did not. What I did was what I do with Kishpishti and baklava to get the syrup to really go down into it. I cut it right away into diamonds or you know squares, depending how you turn them, um, the pan, and then very quickly put on the cold syrup so that the, it could really soak down into all the cuts. Um, okay, so I'm gonna set this aside. And we're gonna get cooking. Uh, so the first thing that we're, I'm going to do, uh, by the way, just to let you know, I did not change a lot with this recipe because I really wanted to honor the recipe that was in the book. What I did change was for clarity, and that includes about um, beating the eggs to what point. It says hold in the egg whites, but it doesn't tell you to do beat them to peaks, to stiff peaks, soft peaks, because if you're folding in egg whites, they're whipped up to, to some point. So I have done it with soft peaks. I'll show you it when we get to that point. Um, and um, I don't know if there's too much else. Uh, that I changed. Um, I have already made the syrup, uh, which is in the refrigerator because we want it to be very cold. You know, if you've ever made tishpishti, baklava, or any of these kinds of dishes, you take the warm dish out of the oven or the hot dish and very quickly put cold syrup onto it. And that's the best way to marry the syrup and the confection, whatever the dessert or the, the dish is. All right, so here we have a cup and three quarters of the coarse semolina, okay? And it has a little bit, you can kind of feel that it's coarse, not a flower uh, in the sense of the fine semolina. And into that, I'm going to put my very soft, now it says five and a third um, tablespoons of butter. You know, the packages of butter have the markings, five and a half. I mean, you know, you know I would go to five and a half if you have questions. It's kind of one of those like five and a third, exactly. No, you don't have, this isn't one of those recipes you have to be so exact. Um, and what I do, you know, I'm kind of funny. I love cooking with my hands. So I like to get it started a little bit, but I switch very quickly. I think the best way to mix this is the way I mix hollow dough with one hand, keeping one hand clean. And you just want to really, you can do it with a spoon. But what I like about doing it with my hands, as you can see, is I can really feel and squish that butter. And every so often you'll need to scrape. My hand, of course, is very clean. Um, but this to me is the best way to blend the, it's like making a pie crust. It's the best way to blend the semolina. And we're almost there. It starts to get a little grainy looking. Okay, you can see. And it's almost all blended with no lump. It was very quick. By using your hand, it becomes very, very quick. So let's make sure I don't take half of it with me. All right. So we've got that. And um, what we want to do, okay. I actually want to add what I like when I made this before, I added the cinnamon and the sugar and then mixed it again. So I have my sugar measured out. I will tell you the recipe calls for a cup and a half of sugar. I use one cup. We have a sweet syrup that's going on top of it. You could probably use three quarters of a cup and it would still be fine. So I'm just using one cup, okay, that goes in. And I'm going to put in a teaspoon of cinnamon, ground cinnamon. It's, you know, cinnamon is one of those spices you would not have a Greek dessert without cinnamon. So, and so I like, you know, it's a little bit of a full teaspoon just because I love the taste. Um, the other thing is that there are other spices often that are put into halva. So here's where I'm going to deviate from the recipe that you have or from the recipe in the book. I'm gonna add a pinch of cloves. I adore cloves and I love the fl extra flavor it brings, but just a pinch. All right, so now I'm gonna do that again. I'm just gonna keep mixing this so that I, the reason I like doing that um, before I add the cognac is because it really mixes the dry ingredients together. And in fact, now I'm gonna add the almonds. Excuse me one moment, just to rinse my hand. I wanna talk to you about the almonds. So it's, it says blanched almonds, first of all, and I want to show you the difference for those of you who don't know. 
these are the raw almonds and these are the raw, the blanched almonds. Now, it's very easy to blanch them, literally 60 seconds in boiling water, plunge them into an ice bed, just throw them into a bowl of, after you drain them, throw them into a bowl of ice water, let them sit for just a few moments and the skin basically slip off. What you can't do now is squeeze this and have the skin come off. Once you blanch them in the water, you can. Now, I'm making this one with the blanched almonds. I ground them up. First of all, there's another point. Here it says three quarters cups, a cup of almonds blanched and ground. It doesn't say three quarter cup ground almonds. If the, um, you have to look at recipes where the modifier is to actually know the proper amount. So because it says three quarter cups of almonds, I put the three quarter cup of almonds uh, into a food processor or mini prep and ground it down. But I measured the almonds whole because that's how this recipe is written. And what it resulted in was one cup ground. And the reason I'm telling you this is because you can sometimes buy um, ground almonds, either blanched, which you can see how white and beautiful that is, but also, um, the one that I showed you that's made, I made it, I wanted to try it. I made it with almond meal from Trader Joe's. I'll be really honest there. Um, but you could use any kind of almond meal. It is not almond flour. Almond flour is too fine. And just like the fine semolina, we kind of gum up this. You don't want to use um, uh, fine uh, flour the almond flour, you want it to have a little bit of texture. You can just, if you do this, you can kind of feel the grains a bit or the pieces. So I'm going to add, this is another dry ingredient. I want to kind of add that. I guess I could use the spoon at this point. We've gotten things mixed up enough. And wooden spoons for sure for baking. Look at that flat, see the flat back? That's why you use a wooden spoon. And that's why challah is best mixed with a wooden spoon. Um, it's just got all this surface area. If you see any lumps, just smush them out. All right. Now we're going to add three tablespoons of cognac. And I'll have to tell you honestly that when I was making this before and it said three tablespoons of cognac, I was like, whoa. You don't taste the cognac as cognac in the finished cake quite delicious. Um, I don't think it's an uh, ingredient in most halavas, but it's quite wonderful. I think it adds a lovely uh, flavor. Okay, there's our three tablespoons of cognac. And this is like the cheapest cognac the liquor store had, to be honest, because you don't need a really good one in something like this. And I, it's not something I drink, so I'm just gonna use it for cooking. All right, and then the other thing we want is to stir in the beaten egg. All right, this is the four eggs, well beaten. All right, and yeah. let me just get rid of this. All right, and just scrape them right into the bowl. All right, don't leave any behind because it's only four eggs, it's not a lot. And you can tell there's just not a lot of liquid in this uh, recipe. All right, now we're going to stir this up, blend it all together. All right. Are there any, by the way, this is a good time, Rachel, if there's any questions. Okay. Okay, great. Um, any questions? In the chat. Let, I don't see anything in the chat, so I'm just encouraging people to please... Uh, right in the chat. Great. Okay. All right. Or comments. If any of you have eaten this before or know of a different halva. Oh, here we go. Okay. Uh, okay, Susan, if we don't have kosher cognac, what can we substitute? Um, I have no idea. I really don't know what, you know, you can use a kosher wine. I'm thinking I would use a white wine as a possibility. It won't be the same, but it will give you a little bit of that kind of underlying flavor. The easy um, kind kosher brandy? 
You could use, if you can find kosher brandy, I, I just figured if they couldn't find kosher cognac. Yeah, they wouldn't, right. But if you can't, brandy would work, sure. And you know what? The truth is, you could use any a kosher liqueur that you like the flavor of that would change the taste a bit. Um, but it'd be interesting, Gramonier or, you know, why not? You know, it'd be fun to exper experiment. I'm going to add fruits and nuts the next time I make this. I think that will be delicious. Um, if Ryan, right. in the chat, it, uh, there's a question if we're going to get the recording. Yes. Yes. Okay. And, okay. okay. So I'm going to move on. I want to get this in the oven. I'm hoping to be able to show you it finished. Uh, but since I didn't make it, you have that. Now, these are egg whites that I had whipped up already because I didn't want you to have to hear me whipping them from scratch. But I do need to spend just a moment uh, whipping them up more because they kind of deflate. So give me a moment. Um, one question that has come up is, if, can it be made vegan without eggs? Oops. Oh, I just got it on. I wanted to show you that a soft peak, we're almost there. What does that mean? So when I do like that and it flops over, but this is a little too soft, as you're whipping it, you'll see it like some of the ridges start to um, stay for just a moment. That lets you know you're getting close. Yeah, yeah that'll work. All right. So let me show you what it, you can see how the, it stayed, but they're soft. They're not, you know, stiff peaks. For those of you who are bakers who've, who've done this, you know, stiff peaks are like, hello. <laughs> These uh, are not. Susan, These are one, Susan, one question about the eggs. Fortuna asked, and someone else as well, can it be made vegan without eggs? So this recipe you'd have to experiment with. Because it's made more like a cake, you might be able to use flax eggs or, um, but the problem you're gonna have is you're not gonna get any volume as we do now when we fold in the egg white. So I'm not sure, hmm. That's an interesting question, I really don't know. I would be inclined to make any of the many other halva recipes that don't have eggs and are vegan. Um, like the halva one, which is, you know, it has butter, but you can use vegan butter. Semolina uh, has milk. You can use almond milk or any kind you like, sugar. It's easier to adapt a recipe like that than something like this that makes a cake with eggs. So I would have to say, although I have often have substituted um, flax eggs uh, in many dishes here because of the beaten egg whites, I don't know. So we're folding in. You don't just dump this in. You put in a little bit. Okay, and you use that folding technique, which is basically up and over. And you just keep doing that. You don't mush it, you don't stir it. The idea is that this is really the only rise in this cake is coming from the egg white. So you get that a little bit blended up. And then we're gonna add another third. Okay, and we're gonna just in. And up and over. And I think you can see it's starting to get a little bit of volume in the, in the bowl from the egg whites being added. And I think also the other thing that would be fun to try is putting this into like a, a bunt pan or another mold that you can bake in the oven and, and doing it in the shape. The ones that are done in puddings are sometimes just done in bowls, but there's also mold for halva. And so I kind of was thinking about, you know, wow, it'd be interesting to try that with this one, in, you know, putting it in the oven and something that gives it a different shape. Now, this is also a great dessert um, because first of all, it's better the second day. So if you're having company, which we now, many of us are starting to think about again, if you're having company, this is a wonderful dessert to make ahead um, and let it sit. Um, I noticed that just like with Tish uh, the second day, it, you know, really had gathered up that wonderful flavor uh, from the syrup. All right. Uh, 
So uh, Annette from uh, has uh, said that she makes halva from that has only sugar, water, butter, farina, and almonds on the top. Well, that's very that's pretty similar to the other recipe in the book and to many halva. But I was just saying with that with the butter you can use a vegan butter. Right. Do you bake it? Is it baked or is it in a pot? Annette, is it baked? Okay. While we're getting that answer, I just want to say I had buttered this dish. I forgot to tell you. It was already buttered so that everything would come out. Now you have this and you just want to carefully, gently spread it out without smushing. And that's the official term, without smushing it, um, because you're treating it a bit delicately with these egg whites, okay? So you're just evening it off very gently using the spatula and trying to get it fairly even without, you know, really. Did, did we have an answer on that? Yeah, Annette, do we have an answer? It's baked. It is baked. Yeah. All right. Are you Romani? It's, it's a real old cookbook. The Art of Greek Cookery. Okay. So, okay. So I'm going to pop this in my preheated oven. And hopefully it will cook in about, well, I don't know. We'll see if we can see it at the end. All right. I'll check it in about, I guess in about 30 minutes. That's the last one I made took about uh, 35 minutes to be cooked through. Okay. Just for those interested, skyviewwine.com carries several brands of kosher cognac. Great. Okay. Now what we're going to do is move on to just a lovely, simple dish that can be a dessert. It can be an appetizer. There's a lot of different things this dish can be. And it's a great nosh, a great little snack, fairly healthy, you know, very healthy actually. So what I make this with is medjool dates because you want this size. You know, if you get regular dates, you're not there, you'll be filling it up a lot, like all night. <laughs> um, they're very small. You can use regular dates, but Medjool dates are more readily available now. Even um, Trader Joe's sells them organic medjools, pitted or unpitted. Um, and they're fabulous. That's what these are. And they're reasonably priced. Now, I want to show you, let's say that this wasn't a pitted date, okay? As it is, I'm, there it is, okay. If this weren't a pitted date, what I would do is cut a little slit in the top, okay? and there would be a pit, I would just pop it out. That's it, that's it. It's easy to pit then. So if you only can find medjool dates with pits, don't worry, really easy to handle. So um, Susan, before you go on, what was the temperature that you're baking it in? 350. 350. Right. Um, well, Judy, I, ask that. Okay. Oh, go ahead. I just wanted to tell Judy that it was 350. Okay. I had, um, crumbled this feta, it's been out for about an hour and a half, two hours, so that it kind of starts to get soft. Um, you got to taste feta because there's many different kinds. So even if it's one you've had before, which this is, I get it from people who know Shamali's, a Lebanese grocer here in DC, but it's, you know, out of um, a case, not a package. Um, I tasted it because it's very salty, this batch. Now, usually, I might add a pinch of salt into this, but this is such salty feta, I'm not going to. So it's very important with whatever recipe you use and some of the recipes in this book that use feta will tell you that, taste it, taste your feta. So what I'm gonna do is, just gonna add a teeny bit, I just wanna bring this together into a smooth mixture, okay? Without it being super loose and you can see it starting to mash together. Okay, you could, by the way, you could use goat cheese, you could use mascarpone, I've done all of those. And I'll tell you when um, pomegranates are in season, I use pomegranate arrows or seeds on top, which is lovely with this dish. And sometimes I drizzle it with pomegranate syrup. 
instead of with date. And we're going to drizzle it with um, a date molasses that actually comes from Israel. But what I want to point out to you, and I'm just mashing this up really well. And what I want to point out to you is that most of what we get is salon is this date, sir, is uh, date molasses. But that's made by boiling date and boiling and boiling and boiling. And you end up with um, this liquid that is skimmed off and you have very nice thick um, molasses. Date syrup is actually very interesting because it's different, it's made differently, it's not cooked. When the dates are harvested, they're put into a uh, basket and you just, as you layer dates upon dates upon dates, they squish each other. And so that liquid comes out and that's actually date syrup and it's not cooked. So what we can buy generally, I've never seen in the US um, actual date syrup that's not uh, cooked as the date molasses is, but that there is a difference. I just thought it was interesting to share that with you. All right, we're almost, you know, you could even uh, actually beat this with the beater if you wanted to, especially if you're making a lot. And I will say feta does not whip up quite as smooth and those of you who might see my cat who just wandered in, um, doesn't get quite as smooth as mascarpone or goat cheese, but I do, I love the taste. I love the saltiness against the sweetness of the dates. And I'm, I just, well, I'm kind of a, a feta addict. All right, feta and halavar and dates are some of my favorite foods. So this is great for me right now. All right, and I just, I'm gonna add a teeny bit more because it's just a little stiff. And I use actually milk, half and half, whatever I have. I've even used non-dairy in this dish. And you certainly could use a non-dairy cheese if you wanted to make it, um, Vegan, there's many, there's a non-dairy feta that's pretty decent. I wish I could remember who makes it. And um, just use some of your non-dairy, whatever kind of milk you use. So um, Susan, there was just, uh, I think Annette from said that she also makes stuffed dates, but a sweet uh, rolled uh, with, with walnuts and rolled in granulated sugar. Right, that that's just another kind. Yeah, there's so many, so many stuffed dates. You could just pop in some almonds into your dates and roll them in like coconut if you wanted. Um, I mean, there's so many different things you can do. This is just one recipe that I think is really nice for Shavuot. Um, okay. And what I, uh, wait, I was saying something. Mm, I don't remember now. I don't remember. Okay. If it's that important, it'll come back to me. All right. So now here's a little trick. Actually, let me just put this back in the fridge. And I stepped on the cat. <laughs> You're really in my kitchen with me. I'm stepping uh -huh. on the cat. All right. Now, here's a trick. So you can use a little spoon. I'll show you that version. I should have one of my little spoons here. Espresso spoons work perfectly. Um, let me see. Here we are. Where am I? Okay, we'll just use this. Espresso type spoons work perfectly. Sometimes you need a little spoon. So here's one method, which is just pop it in like this. It works, it works great. And I like them very overflowing. Okay, so here's another method. I wanna show you just because anytime that you need a pastry bag, so to speak, to pipe anything, here is a trick you can do. Some of you probably already know this. Okay, so you scrape, you put the bag around a jar, a measuring cup, anything that will hold it up like this. And then fold it open, fold it up. You pop in right down to the bottom what it is you're going to pipe. Okay, there we go. And we pull up the bag, 
but I just have to reach for scissors. Okay. And what you want to do is you peel the bag. Now that it's all on the bottom, you shake it. I like you shake it into one corner. And you can see that there's not much up the sides. A great little trick. Peel the bag very tight. So when you squeeze and, and oops, this one is having trouble sealing. Let's see if I just, yeah, I just did it. Okay. Before you squeeze, what you want to do is you cut a little hole in the corner. Let me move it so you can really see. Now, I don't want this to be a huge hole, um, but I don't want it to be so small it can't come out. So I'm going to cut it off and show you about what I cut off. It's just a little teeny bit. And I just dropped it someplace. <laughs> okay. So now you've created a piping bag. Hmm. You can go in if you want and pipe into your dates. You just squeeze it in. Okay, and it comes out a little smoother. I don't know. The difference is really up to what you like. Um, it really doesn't affect taste one bit. It's what works for you. I find this very, very quick. If I'm doing a lot, like if I'm doing um, catering a dinner and we have or an event and there's a lot of these that I'm making, this is a very nice, quick, and clean way to do it. You don't end up with fed on the edges. I like keeping it very clean. All right, so just one after another, and then we'll arrange them. And I'm not doing, this will obviously do more than what I'm doing here. Okay, I just had one get stuck. It was a little lump I didn't know about, and it got stuck. So you just can pull it out. All right, here we go. Um, I'm doing what, two, four, six, eight. This will easily do twice as many, the three ounces of feta. Um, or you can do more if you put less in. Okay, there we go. So this is done. The part of the fun part of this is the decorating. And you know, I just love the idea of how we make food look good because the truth is, as everyone knows, we eat with our eyes first, right? So just gonna kind of play a little bit with this. And I also love playing with food. I used to love making um, sand pies, you know, mud pies when I was a kid. Clearly it translates well to being a chef. Um, now comes the drizzle, and actually I can clean this off and just use this little. So you can put, there's not a lot. You could put this in a squeeze bottle of some sort and, you know, squeeze it, drizzle it that way. But I find too much get, gets wasted unless you're keeping it in that bottle and you use it out of that bottle often. So I just usually have fun, you know, just drizzling. We have a one that doesn't want to stay up. If I can get it to, usually you can just, there we go. Okay. So I'm just drizzling. I like to make sure every single one gets some. You can use on top, we're going to use some chopped uh, toasted pistachios. You could use any nut you like. I happen to be a huge fan of pistachios. So we're gonna sprinkle some pistachios on here. You could use, at um, Rosh Hashanah, I often use sesame seeds, which are you know symbolic of prosperity in the new year. You can roll these in sesame seeds, you, or not with all this popping out. If you wanted to roll the ones that have cheese, you would fill them much less and so that you could still close the top. Okay, that's the trick with the rolling. You have to be able to close the top, whatever your stuffing is. And uh, yeah, there we are. Okay, so here you go. Wow, so, looks good. Beautiful. Yeah, I'm losing one. He really doesn't want, you know what? This one doesn't want to be on the plate. Mmm. That's sweet and salty. If it weren't salty feta, 
Um, I would probably, I would sprinkle some sea salt with some flake salt, but this is such salty feta that we don't need to do that. Uh, so, in terms of the feta, Susan, excuse me for a minute, um, Fortuna said that uh, BioLife makes a vegan feta. Right. For everybody to know. Hmm. That is such a nice, well, two bites actually, but it's really lovely. Um, so those are the two recipes for today. And I really hope you'll try making them. And when you do, make them your own because it's always important to um, make food that you like and to put your mark on it. That's how we ended up with you know, an infinite number of Horosit, for example, because every single community has a different one. If, you know, even by country, we say, oh, this is Turkish, this is Greek, this is, you know what? Then there's like 30,000 variations by community, by family, by the individual chef. And that's okay. That's what food's about. It's about making sure we make these recipes and we carry them on. That is so, so, so important. And we pass them on and we make it our own so that they will, they are part of our lives and hopefully part of you know, our children and grandchildren's lives too. So um, any other questions people have or Rachel? Um, yes. Wanna... Oh, okay. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Um... The, someone wanted to know what you made um, for the Obamas. <laughs> so, okay. The first year I didn't make much. I made a Moroccan chicken with preserved lemons and olives. They, it was a new idea to have a guest chef. They'd never done it. And uh, they didn't quite know what to make of it. And the second year, however, when I, I was able to suggest many recipes, including, believe it or not, a gefilte fish that had like watercress and a bunch of herbs in it. It was so delicious. Um, so I ended up making, I also made, so I added, I was able to add a lot of Sephardic food. So in addition to the chicken, I made Moroccan Harosid balls. I walked in at nine in the morning and said, we got to get those hard boiled eggs cooking. And they are all the chefs there are like looking at me like, she doesn't know what she's doing, mm -hmm. you know? 12 minutes, we'll have hard boiled eggs. And I'm like, no, 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 they have to cook six to eight hours to be the kind of uh -huh. eggs that, you know? <laughs> so I made huevos laminados. I taught them all about it, which was quite wonderful. Um, and um, I'm trying to think, I made, uh, oh, I made a dish that a salad, one of the motivating uh, factors for having a guest chef come in was that Michelle Obama was not so fond of kind of the brisket, potato routine that was going on with these recipes that had been gathered from people who attend the Seder, about 22 to 25 people who are on staff um, and, you know, Jewish. Um, and so she wanted fresh and she wanted green. So uh, I was able to add a salad that's arugula and roasted, um, uh, what, roasted butternut squash. It was supposed to have roasted beets, but as much as Michelle Obama loves vegetables, there's one that cannot be given to her. She hates beef, which amazes me. I'm like, please try these roasted golden beef. But I was told no beef. So it had the squash and then it had pomegranate arrows and a really wonderful uh, citrusy dressing. That was quite nice. Um, and what else? Um, gosh, I can't remember now. It's like, that's starting to fade a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. um, the feeling doesn't fade, but the food is starting to get a little less clear, so. Um. There's a, one other, uh, someone's asking, do you have a cookbook out yet or you're working on one? I'm slowly working on one. I okay. do not have one yet. Okay. Well, hopefully we will know when you do. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And everybody's very curious to see the finished halva, by the way. I'm sure you will show it. And I will show it. And in fact, if, when you're done with questions, if you want, you could do your discussion for 10 minutes or whatever, 15 minutes. And then we'll have, I'll show people putting the cold syrup on the hot halva. Okay, that's so, great. So okay. I hope I got everyone uh, with a question. And uh, people got recipes, right, Ephraim? And this will be recorded, is being recorded, so you can watch that again. 
Um, totally. Yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, someone else said the recipes are delicious. I'm so happy you mentioned the Greek Jewish cheese and egg pie. What is it called? It was my favorite thing. K O U S M E R I. Kusmeri. It's in the. Kusmeri. Kusmeri. I hope I'm saying it right. Somebody correct me if I'm not. Okay. Um, it's uh, on page 95 in this book, if you have it. And all it is, it's very interesting. It's farmer cheese or a bland feta. Remember what I just was talking about tasting your feta. They don't want a salty feta or a very sharp feta. They just want a bland feta. Four eggs, some sugar, some flour. And I want to try it with almond flour to make it gluten-free. Six tablespoons of sweet butter. Sweet butter, by the way, can be salted or unsalted. It's the kind of butter that's sold in the grocery stores these days. Book is older, and so there used to be a difference a bit, uh, apparently, but it's just butter. When he says sweet butter, it's just the kind of butter that you find in the grocery store. And for baking, I always make it unsalted. Actually, I always just buy unsalted because I want to control the salt. And so, uh, and then the well, the syrup, the same syrup that we're putting on this cake, this halva, that could go on to fish tea, that could really actually go on halva, very similar, is going on to the cheesecake. And by the way, I want to talk about the syrup because it says that the lemon, adding some lemon, all the syrup is, is um, a cup of water, a quarter of a cup of honey, half a cup of sugar, and then optional, the juice of one lemon. So on these syrups, I don't consider the lemon optional because they're so sweet. I think the lemon really adds a really nice balance. And so you're, you basically have two, like one and three quarter cup, uh, cups of ingredients. This cooks down, let me show you it. It cooked down to about a cup in about 20 or 25 minutes. And this has become thicker being in the fridge, but you can see it's beautiful. Now, what does the coating on the back of the spoon mean? It won't be quite the same, but if it's a wooden spoon, you'll see the differentiation like you do here. You'll see that it actually stays on the spoon. But really, if you do 20 or 25 minutes at a boil, a, a, not a you know crazy boil, because you'll burn it, but at a boil um, that you can maintain, like, uh, medium to meet, you know, just below medium high, depending on your stove, um, and stir it every so often, then you'll get that syrup. And it will thicken, as I said, in the fridge. I'm going to stick this back in the fridge because you really want it to be ice cold before it goes on the hot cake. Okay. Oh, and I was going to say about the syrup, you should feel free to add uh, orange blossom water rose water, you know, whatever flavors you also like to bring to that kind of sweet syrup, um, I think would be really lovely on this cake, on the halva. Um, so make it your own. So one of the things originally that we wanted to do for this uh, Zoom was also just to open it up to general comments. I mean, some of them we covered with the cooking, but other memories or uh, traditions that your family had uh, that you might want to share with us um, or, or just a chance to chat, which we love to do together as a group. So if anyone does, uh, please unmute yourself and or somehow I can recognize you and uh, we hi, can. this is Louisa Gannis. Yes, hi, Louisa, yes. I just wanted to say I'm taking a class in Greek from Greece. Yes. And it's really wonderful. They're teaching us, uh, you know, how to read it, how to write it. And it's wonderful. It's during it's e-learning. And I really would suggest it for like people in September you'll probably put it on your website. It's very okay. good. Louisa, have you met my daughter and two nieces? What is your daughter? My daughter is Aviva. Yes, I did. And Ivan and Eileen are uh, my nieces, also Regina. Yes, she got the injection. Yeah, she was sick today. Well, she came on, but she yes. hardly uh, 
Yeah, she had her yesterday. She had her second shot and had a bad reaction. Anyway, she loves it as well. But thank yeah. you for that. It's great. Wonderful. Uh, and they're my, also, grandmother, my grandmother used to make susamato, which was with sesame seeds and honey and sometimes some pistachio nuts. What holiday was that for? She would make it and send it to us in the States. Was it solid? Like she had boiled it together so that it became like a candy? Yes, she would put it on a thing. Does it come for any special holiday? Sasamato. Well, we grew up eating sasum, the, that for um, the sesame and honey uh, and the candies that- The uh, candy bar, made. right. Yeah, we she would make them like sasum. diamonds, like a diamond. She would cut it like a diamond. Right, the homemade. So we grew up eating it for Passover because, it, um, you know, for us, it was kosher for Passover. But really, it's one of those things that I actually have some of the, the manufactured kind in my house always. There's some on my coffee table right now. It just reminds me of my father. So they were a very popular sweet. I don't know that um, there's any other, um, you know, special. They just were very popular. and. Yeah, you for yeah we, we get those candy bars. We get them at the grocer here, the Spanish grocer. They have it. Susamato. Susamato. Um, Fortuna also asks about monk fruit. Is that a good substitute for sugar in the halva recipe? Monk fruit? Yeah. No, monk fruit is almost like, is that what I'm hearing right? Monk fruit? That's what the question is, right, Fortuna? Monk fruit is used as a substitute for sugar. And it's, it, it comes in liquid form or powdered form. And I'll, I'll use it like on my, in my smoothies or, right. or my, my fake coffees, which is made out right. of mushroom. I right. use it for that. Um, but I was wondering for the halva, I mean, it, it doesn't taste like sugar, sugar. I have to tell you, I'm being very honest with you. What does it taste like? Is it sweet? It can be like, it's sweet, but it's, it can be like beyond sweet where, where it, it doesn't taste right. So you have to be very careful how many yeah. drops you put in. Like when I make my smoothie and my, my smoothies is usually with kale and blueberries, banana, things like that. And, uh, and almond milk. And I'll add, I'll add like maybe two, two or three drops of, of the monk fruit. And that's enough. That's enough for- I, Then I think you'd have to cut it a lot. Yeah. To have it. But you know, I have to, I will confess, I used coconut sugar to make the oh. syrup that's on this cake. Oh, you use coconut sugar. Coconut sugar. Okay, that which is actually, well, that's, that's vegan. And, but yes. it actually has more calories than, than the monk fruit, but you know what? I'll try it, coconut. Mm -hmm. Try it, um, this, what worries me is you're going, if you've got to use the powdered form, first of all, because it'll change the texture. You know, there's a, a certain amount of the sugar matters to the texture of what you're making when you bake. It adds to the body of what you're making. So uh, you can't use the drops. Um, I think you'll have to experiment you know, you, like I said, you can cut the sweetness to a cup, even three quarters of a cup of sugar, and you're fine. So I don't know what that would equal in monk fruit powder. Uh, is coconut sugar, the, the measurement, is it the same as regular sugar? You use the same amount? Um, I find that it's a little sweeter. In the syrup, it was fine. But if I cook with it, if I bake with it, uh, I find that it's a little sweeter. So I really cut. That's good to know. I but it's not a lot sweeter. I also little. want to thank you. I didn't know. I did not know the difference between almond flour and almond meal. Mm. I make my own almond flour with my almonds. Uh huh. So very fine. They're very. They're very fine. Yeah. So what is the almond meal? I mean, how, well, how almond you, flour is almost powdery. Um. Here, I have some. While we're waiting, Ephraim uh, has uh, said that he's going to send information about the Greek language course, right, Ephraim? Yeah, thank you. All right, I'll show you. I just have, I just got some almond flour, and I want to show you the difference then. 
First of all, this is blanched, obviously, and I've used all the blanched. Can you see the difference in texture? And let me hold this because this that's is very powdery. Okay, that's how mine looks. When that's I an almond flour, and it's even finer than this. Food sometimes. processor. And this, you can feel the difference a bit on that. Thicker. It's just got a little bit of a top feel, but they're so fine. The flour is really powdery. There's like no pieces in it. No. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank Wait. you. Sure. You know, I'm going to check the cake, the hot butter wrapper. Anybody else want to add anything? I just want to say, Susan Stella Hanan Cohen says, uh, thank you, Susan, for sharing your expertise with us all. You continue to inspire. She's commenting on Facebook. Oh, that's very so nice. And everybody's very anxious about your book. <laughs> so you have to, you have to, you have to hurry up. <laughs> yeah, I'm anxious about the book too. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, it's not quite done. So just a couple more minutes and I will pull it out and cut it and show you and we'll be all set. So I took it out. The recipe says well brown. This isn't going to be well brown. There's no way unless it's practically burned and too cold. So all you want to do is cut it diagonally very quickly. Okay, into the size you want. It doesn't take, you don't have to do big pieces because it is very sweet with the syrup. And it's just doing this, which is not stated in the recipe, really makes a difference for how the syrup is absorbed into the pieces. All right, and I'm just gonna turn it the other way and quickly do the same. You really want it to be hot. So I'm working rather rapidly. Okay. And here we go. One more, I think. Uh, this corner. Okay. So now the corners are the best, you know. Can you show, um, can you hold it up for a minute so we can see how you cut it? Okay. So, he, well, you can see it. Out we can see it. There you go. Diamonds. It's just diagonally. Okay. Okay. And um, the edges are toasty golden brown, but the cake itself is not. So I just start to pour, just evenly pour all over. And then I spread, pour some more. Okay. And that's one of the things about eating this the next day is it really has a chance then to soak down into everything. And that's what you want. You want the pieces to be soaked in this. And I really, I pull in sometimes, I just keep doing this with the, whatever amount there is from following the recipe. Okay. And I even leave it cool a little bit on top, as you can see right now. Let me show you it. Hang on. Because then those center pieces, which often are a little bit ignored. Here we go. Okay, you can see, oops, that is hot syrup. <laughs> okay, but you can see that there's a nice amount on top of this dish. Okay, um, here, let me turn it this way. There we go. Looks okay, and leave it cool. Leave it cool on there so it has a chance. It's already soaking down. There was more on the edges, it's all soaking in. And so that's it. And you know, if you could do the same thing as you do for tishpishti if you wanted. I put an almond on top of each piece afterwards, but you really could put something on top of each piece if you wanted, like an almond um, before you bake it. Uh, do you keep it in the fridge or do you keep it out? It'll stay out for a few days at least. And it just gets better and better. Okay, so I don't usually refrigerate it unless, um, and I have actually frozen this cooked. Mm. And one thing I like to do to revive it is to pop it in the oven for a moment and maybe add a little extra sauce, a little extra syrup rather, um, just to revive, kind of give it that sense again. But it lasts a good time on the, it doesn't last because everyone eats it. But, but it will last if it isn't eaten. 
a few days out of the fridge. Okay. Wow. Looks beautiful. And you saw it wasn't so tough. Looks great. Uh, Paula oh, wants thank to you, know. <laughs> thank you. Paula wants to know if you could use rose water and syrup. You can uh, put a couple drops of rose water in the syrup. Okay. Or is it not a Romani oat seasoning? I, I, we're Romani oat, and I don't believe we used, my mother never used. Uh, no, rose water is really a Persian, Middle Eastern. Um, yeah. But you could. But it could be good. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, this was wonderful. You all have to try it. And it's a, it's a little bit different of a halva than the kind you buy in the bar. So a uh, little different taste. It is. It's, it's totally different. And it, just to know that there's so many different kinds of halva, it's incredible. And that it's eaten in so many parts of the world. Right. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So when I was in Israel um, on, uh, you know, hiking across the country, young and as a teenager, we had halva sandwiches. Yep. The <laughs> yes. Because they never spoil, but boy, are they dry. <laughs> Sweet. Oh, my God. But they don't spoil. You just keep it in your backpack and you eat it every day. That's so, great. Yeah. I love it. Okay, well, thank you so very much. So we have coming up on the next Greek family Zoom meeting um, is on Sunday, June 6th at the same time. And uh, the topic is the Greece-Israel relationship. And the speaker will be Tammy ben Haim, Minister for Public Diplomacy at the Embassy of Israel to the USA, who previously served as the Deputy Ambassador of Israel to Greece. And so I, I it's going to be a really good meeting and you'll know, have a chance to ask her some questions about her experience there. And after that, it's really, it's, it's up to you. And we just want to stress to everyone, this is, this is your meeting. And so please let us know what you'd like to see, what you'd like to hear. And we're doing this program today by your request. So please keep the requests coming our way. Here, uh, Rosh Hashanah is like Memorial Day. Yeah, it's early. Labor Day. Mm -hmm. Labor Day, sorry. I get to do that all the time. I was just wondering if we could do something a little before. Maybe sure. the end of August. And sure. Don't, don't worry about whether it's the summer or not. If you'd like to do something, you just let us know. And we're... We're listening to what you'd like to do and when you'd like to do it. So the important thing is to, to let us know what you'd like that to be. Uh, I was wondering wanna... what kind of foods they had for Rosh Hashanah. You know, the Greek foods. Right. Yeah. yeah so we, and so also you might want to read the article from the Washington Post, the links in the chat, because that talks about some of the foods and there's recipes oh. for a few things from Paulette. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so whenever you have ideas for programs, email Shinzi C, email Ephraim, or uh, somehow you know get the get the message to us so we can try to either find um, an expert or a you know someone that has some knowledge of whatever the topic is. And uh, if you have some expertise on something that you would like to share then please let us know as well. And thank you to Ephraim for sponsoring us and taking us under his wings. Can I add one more thing before we, before we close? Just oh, also right. like to let everyone know that we have a special program on um, Thursday, May 6th um, at 8 p.m. Um, the Embassy of Greece to the USA and Sephardic Heritage International in DC are going to launch Cosmopolitan Journeys Through Greek Music. And um, the inaugural event on Thursday will feature leading Greek and Iraqi musicians, as well as, Do and Sephardic musician, um, as well as Dr. Ali El Mayahi, Iraq's cultural attache to the USA. Wow. And um, <clears throat> the 
It will be virtual, just like this on Zoom, um, consisting of a live conversation among Greek musician Spiros Koliavasilis, Iraqi musician Leith Alat Alatar, and Sephardic musician Asher Shasho Levy. And they will discuss melodies that are shared in their, in their respective traditions and demonstrate the connections between the respective traditions through musical performances. And this will include Ladino, for those of you who are, who are interested in that. And it's, it's a really special program because you get to see how the same melodies are, are used in, in Greek traditional music, Sephardic music, including Ladino and other kinds of Sephardic music, and also, believe it or not, Iraqi music. So I think it's gonna be a very interesting meeting. Okay. Well, talking about music, Ephraim, someone had mentioned, or we talked about uh, uh, Ishaki's um, music for Shavuot. Is that something people can access? Yeah, so I'll put that on, on the website, I'll send a follow-up email that will give you a link so that you can listen to the pieces we have from the Romaniot liturgy for Shavuot. Okay, good. Well, Susan, thank you very, very much. It was a pleasure watching you uh, do two things that I have never made. So I learned uh, two ways to do it. I took good notes and I have the book. Uh, and the book that Susan was referring to is, I put it in the chat, it's called uh, The Cookbook, Cookbook of the Jews of Greece, for those of you that uh, were interested, and uh, possibly you can contact Kahila Kadosha and see if they still have copies. Uh, they had ordered some, and I don't know where they are in that process. So I want to wish every, we want to wish you all a Chag Shavuot Sameach, and uh, a wonderful um, holiday and the end of the Sphera period and uh, on to our next program in June. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm so hungry. Yes. Too bad you can't yes. zoom it over. <laughs> so, thank I'm you. Thank you. It <laughs> was you. great. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. We had great attendance. I am just very impressed that you uh, had, you know, everything looks so orderly. And so uh, you say you have a small kitchen and yet you got it all together. Thank you. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank be you. well, everyone. And you can feel free to talk a little bit if you want. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so thank much, you, Susan. Susan. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. So who Thanks else? All right, welcome. Rachel, she yes. was saying she spoke to, we, we had the word chanda today. Chanda. Chanda. Said, yeah. Grandma used the word chanda. Everybody knew chanda, that word. Oh, all my kids know chanda. Everybody knows right, chanda. Right, because only the grandmother. Right. You can't go anywhere <laughs> without your chanda. chanda. I know. <laughs> right. And the chanda always has the chanda always has to have a kuluraki in it. Oh, something. Right. Regina Franceschi Canis, it's Louisa. I my mom went to the Frances. Claro, yeah. 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 Did they tell you that? Yes. Oh. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah, but, your yes. face, you have her face. Thank you. That's so yeah. interesting. You're still in New York, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Where would I go? I want to go to Greece for a while, and I'm debating when is it a good time. Louisa, okay. it was nice talking to you and seeing you, and uh, we'll see you again. In June. Okay. Okay, bye. 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 Regina, have bye. a good dinner. Bye. 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 Okay, bye. Have a good dinner, Regina. Thanks. I'll let you know bye. how it goes. Yeah, bye. okay, bye.
Ya su cocla. Bye bye, bye, bye. Ashelita. Ashelita. Ξέρεις με λέγανε Λέλα στην Ελλάδα. Α, ναι. Λέλα. Για να μην είχα το εβραϊκό το όνομα. Α, ναι. Στη γειτονιά, εκεί που είμαστε. Ναι. Ήμουν Λέλα. Ναι, after the war, μετά από το πόλεμο, πολλοί κάναν αυτό. Ναι. Δεν ήθελαν τα παιδιά να έχουν εβραϊκά ονόματα. Εβραϊκά ονόματα. Εγώ έγινα Λέλα. Η, εγώ ήμουν η μόνη που είχα εβραϊκό όνομα. Ο, αδερφό, oh. ο αδερφός μου ήταν Βίκτορ και τον κάνανε Βίτο. Βίτο. Και η Ρένα ήταν Ρεγκίνα και τη φωνάζανε Ρένα. Ναι, η μαμά μου Εύα την έκαναν Έφη. Ναι. Και yeah. η, η Ροζίτα έγινε Ζήτα. Ζήτα, ναι. Έτσι κάνανε. Ναι. To survive. 